Our first speaker of the day is the chief executive of the Danish Design Center, which works to strengthen the values of all forms of designs in society. So please welcome to the stage, put your hands together for Christian Basin. Thanks very much. Uh, good to see you this morning. I guess uh, a few people had a, had a long night yesterday. It's uh, dangerous when you have that many free, free drinks at a, at a conference, uh, but good to be here. Uh, I'm going to speak about the role of design or designers for the public sector or for government. And I'm kind of wondering, and this goes for no matter where you live, how many of you, how many of you are totally happy with government services? How many of you love government services? Where are you from, sir? Beautiful, thank you. Apart from that, not so many. How many of you work or have worked for government? Just a few, okay. So, my hypothesis is that perhaps there's a potential there that we live in societies also as designers where we're not necessarily happy with public services, but we don't really help. So you could, you could, you could ask yourself, couldn't we, couldn't we start helping? Couldn't we uh, find ways to develop and even innovate how public services work? So I'm going to start with uh, a couple of examples just to get us going. And um, the first example I'll share with you is actually quite an old one, but it's a good one. And it's about how we can work with service design to rethink public services. Now in Denmark, a few years ago, the Danish tax services, so the tax authority, the people who take half of your money away, at least if you live in my country, they looked at their statistics for digital and online services and could see that the age group of citizens that was least likely to use digital tax services to go online and do their taxes was young people. So young people did not go online. What they did was they took the phone and called tax services or they took their bicycle or even sometimes their car and drove down to the local uh, government office and asked for help. And they didn't understand why. Now that's a nice design problem. Why is it that users are not doing what we would expect them to do? Why is it that people who are in their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, you had to find people in their 70s before you found an age group that was as, as poor at using digital services as young people? What's going on? It's a mystery. Back then, I was director of MindLab, which was the Danish government's internal innovation and design team. So we had a, a set of designers, anthropologists, digital developers inside government. And we went and took a look, because that's what you do, of course, with design, right? You go and take a look at what are users doing. And we went out and we visited uh, a young person, um, well, actually multiple people. And we asked, uh, for example, a, a young man called uh, Dennis to uh, show us what did he do when he went online? And so we recorded the audio recording of the session with Dennis. And he was telling us how he actually didn't really know what website to go to. And once he went to the website, he was getting pretty confused about what to do. And we helped him, sort of pushed him a little bit, say, come on, try something, to update your salary. And he goes in and he starts looking around and he, he updates his salary because he got a new job. And in the category for putting in your monthly salary, he puts in his annual salary. So he puts in 12 times his income. What kind of tax penalty do you think you get next year if you put in 12 times your income? And he started saying, I'm getting worried now. I don't understand this. And another a box on the website said employer paid capital pension, which he did not know what is. And he said, I'm getting really worried. And you don't want to be worried when you're dealing with your taxes. Ultimately, we went back to the head office of the Danish tax authority, sat down with the management team and said, so we've been taking a look amongst young people and listening to how they experience the interface. And this is what happens. And then we just played back the recording. And the senior management team 
responsible for digital in the tax office listened to the voices and the stories and the experiences of these young people. And I was there on that session and it got very, very quiet in the room. You know, you could hear like a pin drop because they were realizing that the reason that young people did not use the services is they didn't understand them. And that they had just taken a paper form and flipped onto a digital form without changing anything. And the reason that old people like me were fine using digital services is they had been rehearsing text language, text forms for their, their whole lives. And now when it became digital, it was exactly the same as the paper and they recognized it. They, they knew what to do. But young people didn't because they were new to the service. So what was the consequence? The consequence was we have to create a totally different user experience for young people and tax. And that's what uh, the tax office uh, then did. And it looks like this. It's in Danish, of course, because we are in Denmark. But it, was, it says youth and taxes do-it-yourself guide to tax. It took the office from our little insights workshop with the management about four years before this was implemented. But it did get implemented, and now it's still running. Uh, it's almost 10 years later. So let me share another example, because that's, in a way, the example I just gave you is easy peasy, right? User research, get insights, generate ideas, take the consequences, build the digital. But what if you have a much more complex problem, something that's much bigger and more systemic? So we could call that systemic design. So at the Danish Design Center today, we work on multiple global challenges uh, as the way in which we want to demonstrate how design can make a difference to people and to society and to the planet. And one of such a, a challenge is what we call social transition. What is social transition? Well, uh, one example of social transition or social challenge is uh, that in Denmark, when young people uh, who turn 18, when young people turn 18, one in six have a diagnosis in the psychiatric system. So one in six kids are in such poor mental health that they have a psychiatric diagnosis. 40% of young women between 15 and 25 state that they are in very poor mental health. It's like a systemic societal problem. Why? We don't really know, but it could be something to do with performance pressure in schools, could to be maybe something to do with social media, could have something to do with climate anxiety, could have something to do with uh, it's just difficult being a young person, or all of the above. We don't know, but we know it's a problem. So how do we deal with that, and what's the design challenge? Well, what we do, how we deal with that is we involve young people and psychiatrists and local government officials and policymakers and startups in a process of exploring the future of mental health or mental thriving. So we ran workshops with about 150 different of those kinds of actors asking questions about what would mental health look like in the future by 2050. So now we're going very, very far into the future to open up multiple scenarios and then designing for what would be a better future for young people in this society. And to do that, we, um, we realized that it has to be about a mission or long-term impact where young people thrive, of course. That's the target. That's the, that's the change we want to see, right? We want young people to thrive again. And then we said, how do we, and this is the power of design, of course, and you know this, how do we make something as abstract as that come alive, become concrete, become something we can actually reach out and do something about. So we said, what would a town look like, a city? It doesn't exist yet, we're designing it, but we're designing an imaginary city where young people are thriving. And we realized it has to do with how local governments work, social services work, schools work, how our labor market functions, what it's like to go to a, to a job, how our families are. So these principles you see here are some of the key principles that design concepts we needed to put into this city and make them come alive to create this new society. We're doing that to mobilize people around the change, right? And um, we even created a city map with institutions, they are in Danish, but actually this resource is called Vorby, it means our town. It's online, it's on our website at DDCDK and everybody can use it. It's a public resource for people to engage with. 
We even created uh, films from the future. So we asked uh, actors to play uh, out different scenarios for what would it be like to live in that future, where you're thriving, where you're comfortable, where you're safe, where you have new forms of community relations, whether it's free time, as this video right here, or it's going to work, uh, which is a very a radically different way of working, and, or whether it's going to a learning experience. Now, we don't call it school, of course, in 2050, but we call it learning environment. And I can tell you, for example, that it has a lot to do with being in nature, because we know that nature is, is, a, is, is really, really a powerful thing for thriving and for being uh, in good mental health. Finally, what we did was we then invited everyone who's been part of co-creating this future, of course, to say, OK, now it's here. Let's mobilize. Let's start acting. And then all these different parts of society can now begin to do their work on transforming how we teach, how we educate, how social services work, how psychiatry works. Startups can use the resource for creating new services. Maybe we need to create new types of social media where people uh, don't feel bad about themselves. So we have a, a context where we, of course, have some challenges in the world, right? Uh, we have demands from citizens that are not being met. A few minutes ago, you said you're not necessarily very happy with how public services work, so citizens' demands are changing. We need governments and public institutions to be better. We need to create services that are good for people, but we actually have to create services that are good for the society and even for the planet. So that's what we work on at the Danish Design Center. We're in this, uh, we call it the small uh, green, uh, green building. It doesn't look that green there, maybe, maybe blue, uh, in, the, in the waterfront of Copenhagen. Uh, we're partnering with the Architecture Center and other institutions around uh, creativity and design. Um, and what we say is, uh, that we work to create a world uh, where we unleash people's ability to use design as a powerful, positive force for change. And we work on these social issues, but also on green transition, circular economy, uh, and uh, digital and organizational change. I've uh, spent some time, uh, actually I've spent a lot of time <laughs> writing about this, uh, publishing on this, the issue around how can design drive innovation, especially in the public sector. Uh, originally, I'm a political scientist by training. I did my doctoral in design. But I do think, incredibly enough, that we are still seeing a huge potential for design and designers to make a difference uh, for the public sector and for society. Why? We have work to do, right? We have problems we haven't fixed yet. We have problems like these. How do we create growth that's inclusive and sustainable? How do we think about getting everyone involved in our economies and in, in our societies? How do we maybe design for better democracy and participation and influence? How do we design for climate change and the green transition? These days, you might even ask, how do we design for more security? Lots of designers are very busy around the corner from here and, and technologists in, uh, in, in the war going on, as an example. So what I think is challenging is that we're not really good enough, are we? For example, how many of you are familiar with something called the United Nations Global Goals, Sustainable Development Goals? A few of you. So the United Nations is hoping that the world will be better by 2030 and has established 17 different goals for that. Those goals were established and decided by all countries on, the, on Earth in 2015 with a 15-year time horizon towards 2030. We are halfway now. Guess what? We're not going to reach the goals. Not even close. Not even a country like Denmark will necessarily reach our goals. So if we're not, as humanity, succeeding, then we have to go faster. We have to do better. And that's why we need designers. Because we need the creativity, we need the insights, we need the facilitation skills, we need the visualizations. We need the full range and the bandwidth of what designers can do. Because I think that enabling Transition, let's just call it big change, as collectives, as, as people together, is really the big uh, challenge we have in society today. And you think, we can't change. You think that things are the way they are. But if you think that, then you're certainly not thinking like a designer, or even like uh, this uh, anthropologist who did a study recently. It's a nice book. It's called The... Uh, Dawn of Everything. It's a, it's a book that basically describes early humanity. So 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 
it turns out humanity has been very creative. We've created cities, we've created farming, we've created farming and cities, we've been hunter-gatherers, then we shifted to cities, then we shifted back again. We've been very creative in, throughout history in how we organize ourselves. But today it seems like we're kind of stuck. We have not that much imagination. We, we, we think we have to have a particular model of society or a particular model of business. Who says it has to be that way? And maybe with the crisis we have on our hands, maybe we need to start thinking more creatively about how we even organize ourselves. I'll get, I'll get back to that uh, a little bit later. So you can say, how can design help government help us? How can we make government work for us, right? And when I say that, you also have to remember that government's a little bit different than business. So m most of you work in the private sector, yeah? So here are just a few of the differences between working in government or with government and working in the private sector. Complexity of stakeholders. Almost no matter what you do in the public sector, you have a huge stakeholder landscape. They're just people that care about what you do. Whether it's childcare, it's schools, national policy, climate change, a lot of people care about it, and the press and the media care about it, at least if you live in a country with just a little bit of free press. So you have to deal with that in the public sector, which also, of course, comes with both opportunity but also risk. Transparency usually is high. Again, I'm speaking about European and maybe sort of global countries that are more or less democratic, but high transparency, which means that citizens, the media, can look at what the government is doing and be critical. That makes it also a bit risky to do things in government because if you innovate or change things that are not working, you get in trouble. Strategic conflict is another way of saying politics, but think of having a company where you have a board. In government, we call that parliament or city council. And on your board, people are fighting each other and they don't agree with each other and they're not supposed to agree because they have different ideological and political standpoints. So how do you run an organization if your board of directors is in disagreement. But that's how government is. And it's a good thing because that's called democracy. But then how do you then run that, right? You have to be able to deal with that kind of conflict and, and different interests if you work with the public sector. Risk appetite, turns out it's pretty low. It's also not that high in, in, the, in the business sector, is it? We like to control things. We like predictability. Managers like to control things. So I'm not saying that business is necessarily hugely innovative, unless you're running maybe a startup, but government has a pretty low tolerance for risk, generally speaking. And finally, user relations. Government does not serve customers. It's not just a transaction where somebody pays and gets something in, in, in return. Spending 10 years in primary school, it's not a transaction. It's a relationship to teachers, to other kids and their families to a community, right? Being in a hospital, hopefully, it's not just a transaction. You'd like to be treated well as a customer, yes, but you also want to know your rights. You want to be treated with dignity. You want to be treated as a citizen. You might even be, want to be treated in a hospital as a human being with all the facets that comes with that. So government is not just about customer service, even though sometimes we can feel if we just had good customer service, it would go a long way. So public design or design in general, because this is kind of could be in principle any kind of design, right? It's challenging assumptions, asking good questions, engaging with people, involving users, getting the insights, experimentation, prototyping, testing, right? It's making the future concrete, whether that is concrete digital service as in the case of the tax office, or of making the future concrete as in a vision of a very different society. We can work on all those different scales, right? And speaking of scales, we can work with the whole bandwidth of what design can do, right? We can work with visual and communications design. We can move beyond that. We can work in the digital space. We can work with services, and we can work with systems. Yesterday in the panel up on this stage, we talked about how to zoom out and zoom in on a particular ch challenge or problem, and that is what good designers can do. You can start from anywhere and still be part of that kind of work. So what happens then when creativity or design meets bureaucracy? So I was uh, running this innovation and design team 
from inside the public sector in the Danish government, in the, in the central government, for eight years. And uh, this is what it looks like uh, inside our, uh, our building. It looked like that. This is, uh, it was called MindLab. It doesn't exist anymore, but it existed for quite a long time, 16 years total. I came in about after a few years. Um, it, we didn't always have the flowers. Uh, we took them in for the, for the photo op. Uh, but we basically have like this kind of a white space think tank where you could go in and go nuts with post-its and uh, write on the walls and so on. But more importantly, we had about 400 square meter space inside the heart of uh, the central government district in Copenhagen, and we could facilitate policy dialogues, workshops, get user engagement, invite in citizens and companies to work with policymakers, work with civil servants to better understand people's lives, do the kind of work that we did with the tax office to really support the design of something that works much, much better for people. Doing what designers do best, explore uh, what's going on, get up close to people, video, audio, listening, getting patterns, co-creation, co-design, involving people to change, and then, of course, experimenting. And we've seen a, really a huge rise in this kind of work around the world. So uh, that's not just Denmark, that's uh, the UK. Some of you probably are aware there's a whole design team in the heart of the UK government working on uh, government digital services. Uh, United Nations runs 60 design teams and labs all over the world. Uh, United States uh, has multiple labs, including at the Office of Personal Management in Washington, DC. Canada at one point had almost 100 social innovation labs. Some of them uh, were uh, closed down again, some of them still running. So you have this huge, huge focus on what design can do for public services. If you start looking into this, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be surprised. Now, let me give you some examples, some more examples of what kind of, what, what kind of work are these designers doing? What, what kind of tasks could that be uh, uh, about? One could be designing out homelessness. In Denmark, we have a, a, an alliance on, on the systemic problem of homelessness. We all, we all have problems with homelessness in our cities. We have it in Denmark. I did a morning run this morning in Budapest. I saw a couple of homeless people on the street there as well. How do we change that? Well, an example is from London, right after the financial crisis, uh, uh, the Design Council in the UK worked with a uh, uh, borough of Lewisham, which is a borough uh, part of, uh, of London. And um, here they uh, worked in a systematic way to rethink how to provide services for homeless people. And here we were talking about people who had maybe had a white collar job, got unemployed during the financial crisis, and then were on the street with their families. They reduced homelessness by 50% through user insights, redesigning services, getting housing available, and making it work. Another example, in Australia, some families are so violent and dysfunctional that the Australian government takes the children away. That happens in this country as well. That happens in Denmark. In fact, in Denmark, at one point, the prime minister gives a speech saying, I think we should take more children away from families because that's a solution to violent and dysfunctional families. Now, in Australia, they said something different, and this was run through a design uh, project. They said, it was in Adelaide, in Australia, they said, what if we can help families not be violent? What if we help families not hit their children anymore? How can families thrive again and be, be good families? And what they did was they designed a program where families could help other families. Even with the so same social economic background, typically ethnic minorities, typically low income, typically living in the same areas in, in the city, some families were doing well, others were not doing well. The families that were doing well, that were fine, not beating the kids, were invited to help the families in crisis. And by matching those families, for the cost of taking one kid away and putting them in foster care, this program, is called Family by Family, can help 200 families uh, do better and thrive again. Okay? That's also an, a bit of an efficiency and better use of public money and probably a lot better for the children and for the families. So the leader of that program told me this works as a catalyst, as a way through design to have a very, very different experience. Another example, adults with disability. Most societies have challenges with that one. Uh, a Danish uh, institution, local institution in the city of Odense, Denmark, 
worked on transforming the user experience of being a handicapped person, mentally disabled person, in a workplace. So it's sort of kind of a protected institution. How do we make that place thriving, fun, meaningful? How do we involve people with a disability, mental disability, to be the designers of their own everyday life? Empowering them, even though their IQ may not be as high as ours, they can still have dreams, they can still have things they want to do. So how do we make them the ones deciding on their everyday life? And this is a quote from the manager who did that project. And she's also saying that sometimes when we use design for innovation, these practices, they, they work for a while, then we have to create some new ones. These organizations change. Leaders change jobs. Organizations get merged with others. There's structural reform in government, and sometimes things change. And that's okay. We just have to keep going at it, right? So what's the opportunity? What can design really do? We can radically improve experience for citizens. We can get better outcomes. We can solve problems, for real, more fundamentally, more humanly than with any other discipline I have seen. Of course, sometimes we need technology. Sometimes we need managerial changes but it's the design process and design skills and competencies that are the catalyst of the change. And here's a lot of uh, very nice uh, types of value that are very well documented around the world of what can we get benefit from this. When it's done right, when it's done well, and when it's done in an environment where public managers and decision makers actually want the change. Because if you're a designer or a design team working with leaders who don't want the change, or politicians who don't want the change, then it's difficult. So that is, of course, part of the work to work with people that are ready to try something different. There are also pitfalls in big parts of the world, probably also here. It's still new. It's still something that government does not do in any systematic way. So how do we get started? How do we get the first experiences? How do we build confidence that this is a way of working? How do you embrace this connection between creativity and user engagement with bureaucracy and management in big organizations. And here are just some of the uh, challenges. And that's uh, why I've spent a very big part of my career teaching uh, public servants. Uh, usually, I don't have a room of designers. It's usually actually a room of, uh, of, of managers, either in government or in, on, on, or in business, because we need to build the skills and the confidence to do that. Everything I've shared with you is something that designers around the world have worked on for the last several decades. It's not that new, actually. So what I'm interested in is not just saying where we are and what we should do with respect for we have to do all of this, but where are we heading now? Where are we going now? Where should we be going now? I've hinted at it a little bit already, but I think that the problems we've, that are facing society are bigger than just a nice functional digital service or a good experience visiting a government office. That's a hygiene factor that should just work. I know that's easy to say coming from Denmark, but we do have even bigger problems that designers need to work with. Okay? We have even bigger problems and that's an opportunity. Back in the 1970s, there was an American designer his name uh, is, uh, was Charles Eames. Does any of you know about Charles Eames or the Eames Design Office? Any of you have a chair from Charles Eames, an Eames chair? Not so many. So beautiful furniture, uh, furniture designer, but also industrial designer. For example, back in the 1970s as well, uh, the Eames Design Office designed one, a, a pocket Polaroid camera, one of the first pocket cameras that was instant photography, right? In the 70s. Beautiful piece of engineering and design work. At that time, a French journalist interviews Charles Eames. Oh, by the way, he runs the office with his wife, uh, who's equally uh, uh, Ray Eames, who's also a very, very good designer. I have to remember, it's both man and woman running this together. But he gets interviewed, and the French journalist is, is, is trying to understand how he talks about design. Because Eames doesn't just talk about products. He talks about thinking. He talks about solving problems. A few years later, they create this Powers of Ten film for IBM about zooming in and out on our planet, zooming into 
micro level, uh, with, uh, in atomic level, zooming out. It's a 10 minute film, zooming out to see our universe. So he thinks in a very, very flexible, very open, modern way. And this French journalist gets really, really confused because she's like, but what are then the boundaries of design? I mean, if, if, if everything in the world is designed, then what are the, what are the boundaries? It's a good question, of course. But being, um, being American, Charles Eames is a little bit rude. So he answers with, with another question. He says, what are the boundaries of problems? So when the problems change, design must change. In the 1970s, yes, we had problems of how to design a small camera, how to design great furniture. We also had bigger problems like an energy crisis. We had problems around the Cold War. We had emerging technology. For example, microcomputers came in the 1970s. So we had problems around what will computers do to our labor market and workforce. Those were problems definitely back in the 1970s. But today we have other problems. Yesterday on this stage, we talked about the problem and the opportunity of artificial intelligence. What's the role of design as the challenges around artificial intelligence are expanding? What's the role of design when our climate is getting a little bit warmer? What is then the role of design? For example, in circular economy or rethinking product design and business models and, and, uh, and reuse of materials and so on. So those are the questions that uh, my colleague and friend uh, Jens Martin and I asked ourselves when uh, writing this book that came out last year. I think there are a few copies uh, that will somehow be handed out later today at the conference. But basically to say, when problems change, we must change our discipline. We must take the foundations of design, which are pretty universal, and then leverage them for something bigger, something more important. That goes for working with government, but it actually goes for working inside companies, inside business. It goes for startups as well. So we need to innovate how we innovate, or sometimes we're provokingly saying, we have to get the thinking into design thinking. Because design thinking has become sort of the business lingo for using design in all kinds of ways in, in, in enterprises and in government. But what are we thinking when we design? So I'll just very briefly uh, share a few, uh, just the highlights or the, the ideas in the book very, very briefly, because you have to read it, of course. But we have to think longer time horizons. Like we did with the young, young people, we said, we need to think toward 2050. Why? Because that is the systemic horizon for the change we're looking at. We don't transform schools and work and family and cities in 10 years or five years. We transform them in a generation. But what about thinking for a generation? So we can act differently today, of course. So we can act today, but with an intent on long-term change. What about life? Well, what we mean by life is that we all think we're designing for users, right? For people. But increasingly, we have more stakeholders to think of, for example, other living things than people. Today, when you design technology, you might want to think about what's the climate footprint of the software or the technology that you're designing. What about other living things? How do we design in ways, for example, in cities that bring in biodiversity or nature again? So how do we expand our perspective on what is alive? We're also living in a world where people live longer. What are the opportunities and challenges in an aging society? Life is a big question, but it's a question we need to address and think about when we design. Then we have uh, proximity. Proximity is about closeness. It's about empathy. It's about how do we feel close to users to what we design for. And again, we need to begin to rehearse feeling proximate to more people. Yesterday, also in the panel, we discussed that proximity to people means, for example, understanding that women are sometimes different than men. For example, in a car accident. But safety in cars today are only designed to be safe for men. Because don't, we don't test, crash test cars on women or, we, or female uh, crash test dummies, right? So for 100 years, we've designed cars to be safe for men which means that there's a 70% chance of serious injury and death higher than for women than for men in a car accident. It also turns out, now that you dive into that area, that we haven't feel proximate or close to women in medicine or life sciences either. 
So when life science companies test new drugs, they don't test them on women. Do you know why? Why would you choose not to test a new drug, a new medicine, on females? Any idea? Yell. It's because women's bodies are different, and, and they work differently, and they're more complex, and once a month, usually something else happens that's kind of disruptive as well. And then we are too lazy to deal with it. So somebody in healthcare for the last 100 years have decided we just don't even want to bother with women's bodies. But proximity might also mean marginalized people and groups in your society. Recently, I was speaking in Australia. In Australia, there's been people living there for the last couple of hundred years coming from Europe. But there's been people living in Australia for 65,000 years that are aboriginals, indigenous people. And the society in Australia for a while has kind of had forgotten that they were there, as had people in Canada. People in my own country, we've forgotten that we have a small, a small island. It's a, it's, a very, actually very, it's a very cold place, but it's called Greenland. People are living there with a different culture, a different ethnicity, and we forgot that they were there. And recently, Denmark got a very, very scathing United Nations report saying we are biased and mistreating disadvantaged families and people from Greenland because they don't speak Danish. And we design all the forms, all the government things in Danish. So we have to think about who are we designing for. Okay, I'll just go skip a bit quickly across some of the other things. Sectors, we need to design across sectors, public and private and civic sectors, find solutions that work across sectors. Value, we have to think about not designing just to make a profit, but we have to think about other kinds of value. In some, in some areas, it's called, in the, in the financial sector, it's called ESG, stands for Environment, Social, and Governance, which turns out to be important in the financial sector for companies to live up to requirements from the European Union, to be responsible for the environment and climate change, to be socially responsible on labor market and labor rights, for example, or even just harassment and uh, treating people okay, and governance meaning, for example, transparency and uh, good management systems. But more broadly speaking, what if we are designing for a world that needs social change, needs to address climate change, and what if companies were built not to make a profit first and then maybe give a little bit of money to good causes, but what if companies were built from the start for impact, to create value and thereby make a profit, not the other way around? Just think about that for a moment. And then dimensions, it's all about people and AI and how can they work together. Now, so what I want to end with is really to say a few things about where could the future of public design go. So I know for some of you, you might feel, well, we have to get started on the basics, but I would say just give you a sense of where could this field be heading. One, I've already said it, more systemic design, working on long-term missions, cross sectors, take on big problems, like for example, thriving, it could be any kind of problem in society, set direction, mobilize people, build capacity and skills to really work together on big change. I think that is a space where we need designers because most people are not very good at facilitating work across sectors, across levels. It means we have to reverse innovation. Instead of innovating for one product or one service, we need to mobilize many, many more activities to create a big change in society or to create new markets even for companies. And so it's like reversing the innovation process from, from going from a, for a funnel to going for more for a megaphone, getting mobilization around a vision for the future. It's a role that designers can play, just like the example I gave around young people, which means we need new management roles as well. Maybe some designers could play that role, but we need someone to get up every morning and say, we are going to address homelessness and we're gonna end it in this city. No more homelessness. That's the direction we're going for. By 2030, we will not have a single family or person homeless in our city. But how do we then do that? We mobilize actors, we work with them, we invest in projects and changes. We build capacity, we learn, we look at the data, we look at what's happening and we communicate what we're doing. That's one example of this long-term uh, transitions, management, you can say. Ethics and inclusion, that's another agenda. It's coming out of some of the uh, points I made before around uh, expanding our thinking. So as an example of that, 
uh, the Danish Design Center, we created something called the Digital Ethics Compass. It's basically a navigating tool for any designer who's building a digital product. That might be some of you. But when you design digital products, how do we make sure that it actually works for people? How do we make sure that digital products are responsible? Because it can be very, very tempting to do all kinds of fun things, to manipulate people, to build an AI that does all kinds of funny, interesting, scalable things. But how do you actually focus on good behavior? What is good behavior or what is ethical design? It's to not manipulate people against their own interests, avoid manipulation. It's making technology understandable so people understand what they're facing and what they're interacting with. It's, it's avoiding to create inequality. What does that mean? It means that most data, as we all know, is biased already. So when you feed biased data, ethnically, gender data, economic data into an algorithm, if you, if you, if you input garbage, you get garbage out, right? So how are we sure that the products we design with flawed data, at least, biased data, is not biased? Don't create inequality and give users control. Allow users, of course, to drive the technology, not the other way around. If there's one role of designers in this world of technology and AI in the future, it is to put humans first. And by the way, maybe also the planet first. A lot of other people will be very, very keen to put the technology first and put profit first, but there's a role for designers. I said this already, from humans to life, thinking about designing services and products that are regenerating our natural environment, creating with all living things in mind. An example could be another project we're doing called the New European Bauhaus. Now, the Bauhaus was an architecture and design school, some of you may know it, back from the Weimar Republic, got uh, terminated, uh, ended by the Nazis. Today, the European Union has re revitalized the idea of a new European Bauhaus. Maybe there's a relationship because the president of the European Commission is, is, is German. Maybe there's a connection there. But what is interesting is that the European Union has said, what if artists, designers, and architects are the ones driving the green transition? Not finance, not technology, not business, but architects, designers artists in front. What might that look like? And now the European Union, especially the European Commission, is investing millions and millions and millions of euros in driving the change of cities, new forms of renovation through architecture and design with a view to addressing climate change and social inclusion. So cutting across multiple kinds of value, and we are running this project, we call, uh, we call it Desire. Uh, don't Google it, because if you Google Desire, then you get other results than you want. But if you say Bauhaus and Desire, then you, might, then you might find it. The reason we call it Desire is that we think we have to create this irresistible circular society where it's beauty, it's aesthetics, it's form that drives change. So that we can create more climate-friendly behavior and buildings, not because of regulation or policy or force, but because it's beautiful. It's something we want to live in, right? and a society where we reuse our materials in different ways. One example is in uh, the city of Kalimborn, Denmark, we're designing uh, a new, uh, a new uh, home for the architecture school, the Royal Academy of Architecture. And so how would you take a school of architecture to a provincial city, to an old uh, rundown train station actually, and transform that into something uh, climate, uh, carbon neutral and livable? Finally, last one. I wanted to um, provoke you a little bit here by the end that maybe we can also redesign how we organize, how we run organizations, uh, how we manage uh, work, and maybe to create better environments for, for designers too. So uh, in our organization, we asked ourselves, what's our fundamental view of human nature? What do we believe about people? We have this fundamental view that I think most of you might share, that people are responsible, that people can take responsibility, that people want to help each other, that people can both lead and follow each other under the right circumstances. So fundamentally, we decided in, in my organization that people are fundamentally kind. That's it. But if you say that, people are kind. What kind of organization and management would you then design? So um, 
we changed our organization to um, an organization where everyone chooses their own leader. Because, of course, people can do that. And everyone can offer to be a leader for others. And everyone votes with their feet and chooses what to work on. Everyone can make decisions about everything. People can hire other people. Right now, we are considering whether people cannot also make decisions about their own salary. Because if we just have transparency around what everybody gets paid, which we have, everybody knows each other's salaries, and people think they should get paid more, they can ask their colleagues, should I get paid more? If they say yes, then you get paid more. Simple as that. Maybe it's, it's, it's a little bit complex to implement, but we're working on it. So I think that there's a role for designers uh, to think about uh, organizations not as uh, human resources, but as people that are working together to solve problems. And I think we are on the cusp of seeing, and we know that because there's things like teal organizations, humanocracy, holacracy. There are many models out there now about redesigning how we work together and where designers, I think, can play a key role. My colleagues say that we are now more an organism than we are even an organization. Because we are more fluid, we are more adaptive, we're actually re reacting to the fact that, that the boundaries of problems are changing, so the boundaries of organizations should also change, right? So, get the books, uh, use, uh, use some of our tools uh, at our website, at the DDC, uh, all available publicly, of course. And remember that, this is a quote, a manager, I, I, I interviewed a manager from the public sector 10 years after the first design project, and this is what she said. That when you work with public organizations and managers, it can really, really be transformative. It can transform the way they view themselves, the role of government, the way the government can make sense to people. So I look forward to discussing with you uh, what the problems are that you want to work on, uh, small and large. Thanks for listening. Thank you for kicking off the day with such an inspirational topic. We have Tons of questions. We can't get through all of them, but we can get through a few of them. And uh, you can catch Christian during the day if you have any other questions. So the first one is, to design for the government, often uh, you need to be a part of an inner circle, and they design in their favor. This limits innovation. How could we come over this? Excellent question. I know, I know there will be so many good questions because you're a great audience. Um, so, there are different places you can position yourself, right? You can go inside the uh, heart of darkness and be inside government as a designer. When we employed the first designer at uh, MindLab, which is a, as a public servant, the Ministry of Employment, which was one of our partners, didn't even know how to place a designer within a government uh, organization. They didn't know what to pay her. They didn't know what category to put her in because they'd never done it before. She was the first designer across out of 20,000 people in these different ministries. But the advantage of being inside is you're very close to the power. You're close to decision making. You can collaborate directly with those who make decisions. But yes, you are, of course, also confined in some ways. But you have to balance the ability to be close and be impactful with the limitations it might put. Then you can be a consultant or outside and giving advice and working with government on projects. But that still means that you have a client relationship, which also comes with its, its challenges. And then finally, you can maybe build a startup or build a company that provides services with or instead of government and does uh, something on public problems and, and social impact or green or whatever it might be. So you solve public problem, but you do it in the, in the private sector way. I think all those three have advantages and disadvantages. There's no perfect place. But you might, uh, you know, in your career, try on different sizes. But in my mind, we need to get more designers all the way into government because they can also be the ones that pioneer the way and they're the ones that can again recruit and include and, and commission consultants and advisors from the outside. So we need to get all the way inside as well. Thank you. The next question. 
Did you run into difficulties to think long-term and uh, run long-term projects when every four years there's a new, new government? That's also an excellent question. So one of the reasons that we have taken this scenario foresight work and, and looking forward towards what we call the preferred future, much longer term, is that we get caught up in these election cycles of two years, four years. Often when you start a project, it's after the first year of government, then you have a couple of years to run it, and then there's election coming, and then everything grinds to a halt. So clearly, the electoral cycle is a problem. But in business, you might have a three-year strategy or a five-year strategy, or you might have an annual budget uh, that also limits innovation, right? So we have those constraints. But I do see more and more politicians, and maybe especially in cities and local government, that realize that we're going to transform our city to the future for next generations. We have to work on something that goes beyond my own election period. And I've seen even mayors say that out loud. I know I will not be there myself, but I do care about the future of my city. So we do take a 10-year perspective, for example. So it's, it's a condition, the electoral cycle, but we have to work on it. Thank you. The next one is, most of us work for private enterprises where profit drives everything. How could we justify designing for society and environment when users bring the money? Well, first and foremost, I do see quite a few designers making a profit working uh, with government clients, even though they may be a little bit more difficult to rent a contract with and they, maybe they, they, they pay a bit less. You can make a profit or you can be a profitable advisor or consultancy uh, or technology company working with the public sector. Uh, sometimes too profitable, actually. In my own country, listening to uh, news coming back uh, down here yesterday, uh, we spend about 500 million euros 500 million euros on technology for the Danish tax authority when it comes to assessing property value in Denmark, it's still not working. It's not working. So we've given 500 million euros to com technology companies with no results so far. So don't tell me you cannot uh, make money on, uh, on the public sector. I'm not recommending it because we want it to work, but there are some people who've made a lot of money on that. So that's an opportunity for business as well. But that being said, what if we build companies that are, that are built for public purpose, that are built to make a difference in society, and it's the impact we go for, and of course we need to be sustainable financially. Maybe not a huge profit, but maybe some profit. That's fine. We see a huge growth in the B Corps certifications of companies, where companies certified that they are working for a positive societal impact, but it's fine to be profitable as well. It, it's not a, a either or, it can be a both end. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. Uh, wouldn't redesigning our economic system, also known as capitalism, be inevitable to solve most of the problems mentioned in the talk on the long term? So the question was to redesign it or change it? Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> also a very good question. So I think there is a movement right now which is beginning to challenge some of the fundamentals of capitalist society. Definitely. It's called degrowth or foundational economics, uh, maybe a regenerative economic. It's, things are happening. So recently we created a very large program on circular economy. Circular economy, as you probably know, is creating uh, products and services and businesses that allow resources to flow back and not be uh, thrown away, but to be kept in flow, right? Recycling. When we launched the program, very ambitious, it's, it's, it's eight year long program, quite well funded, six partners, 4,000 Danish companies involved at very, very concrete level, help them redesign product services to be more circular. Somebody goes online right away and says, you know what? You're not gonna impact climate change enough by that. You cannot do that because just the energy used to manufacture anything cannot be carbon neutral. You have to address the foundation, which is capitalism. And then this guy even relates to the world of physics, which is that, of course, you cannot create anything in the world without using energy. And so suddenly we have a, a bit of a public storm on our hands where people are, are saying this project is not good enough. And he's right. It's, it's, it's a start, and we're going to get somewhere, and we're going to get much better than we are, but it's not going to solve climate change. So it is, it is happening that people are questioning the foundations. 
And that will probably grow as a move, um, but it's still probably, probably a, a bit a uh, long way until we totally dismount capitalism. What I personally think we need to do is to build better models, like uh, Buckminster Fuller, the American architect designer would say, build better models that show how we can organize ourselves in a different way, how we can run our economy differently, and then the good models will replace the old ones. But we have to start building the new models that will replace the old ones. And maybe that is taking on the foundations. Thank you. And now the question that everyone, like some of us, have been waiting for. Do you have job openings at the DDC? Well, we have one job opening because I'm stepping down three weeks from now. So I'm stopping after nine years as CEO. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, they're doing the interviewing right now, and, and you have to be able to speak and write Danish. Uh, so, so I'm afraid that's maybe not so relevant. But uh, reach out, get in touch. Um, we always like to connect with people. And uh, we've actually had a few uh, fellows or interns over the last year or so, actually two colleagues from, uh, from Japan, um, designers. Uh, so um, get in touch. Cool, thank you. And thank you. last but not least, we have a small gift for you from the organizers, some oh, wow. tea. Is this co coffee? It's tea. tea. It's tea, great, excellent. And also some artwork. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christian Basin.